<laughs> that was freaking the Hale Varsity Radio Saturday Morning Show. Strap yourselves in. Here are your hosts, Chris Schmitz. Y'all don't even know he was a virgin until he's 28, and now, roll tide. And Mark Cranach. Time has come for someone to put his foot down. And that foot is me. Welcome to the weekend. It's Hail Varsity Radio. It's Chris Schmidt. It's Mark Cranach. It's it? Elijah Herbal. Uh, How long someday, are we going to do this? The, How long the, are we going to do this? The bad oh, habit. The, the bad habit the, of calling it Hail yeah. Varsity Weekend. I think the I think the listeners slash viewers should name this show. Well, an uh, idea. they don't know they when it's going open. to start. Is the problem on the weekend? <laughs> Maybe we do something with that, all right? That's part of the new brand. No, I'm not, that, I'm that, not one's on me this morning. that one's on Elijah's, me this morning. Elijah's like, you liver spot bastard. Shut up or I'm going to pull the plug on all of it. <laughs> I, uh, I feel like I set a bad example on week one of this endeavor uh, by not showing up. I think I think at that time we were going to go at 7.15, was it, or 7.30? 7.30 is going to be the so, goal. I heard 7.55. That's what I heard. Oh, is it now? Yeah, that's like because when you said it, you were like seven thirty-five, right? Right? You remember that? Uh-huh. And I was like, okay, that's how so, I remember it. Yeah. I don't see why. Thank you, Elijah. I don't see why. I don't see why we can't open it up and have the listeners and viewers who've been with us since '09 mm-hmm. in various forms uh, can just go ahead and name the show, and we can just pick it. Pretty soon, we're gonna just. Put our feet up until eight oh four, and Brandon Vogel is going to be waiting in the green room. Green room, going, where are you guys? Yeah, I know, I'm here for your show, and you guys aren't yeah. even here yet. Well, it's weird, you know. And I've, I've had this conversation with a few people, and they're like, "I didn't know you could have a live podcast." Sure, it's you like, can. well, yeah. well, it's not really a podcast at that point. It's just a, it's a live it's show. A, it's a live show, digitally released. Mm-hmm. podcast it becomes a podcast later mm-hmm. so we can't really call it the podcast because that takes away the fact that we do this live a lot of podcasts they do not we do no. a lot of live shows go on the radio we do not well <laughs> so we can't call it radio and we, we can't call it a podcast what we do, do monday it? we do monday through friday we're, we're... i'm talking we us three sure. on saturday well saturday you do football season the nebraska sportscaster of the year definitely has a radio show Listen, uh, you're going to be roped into Saturdays. You're going to be roped into some Saturdays. We'll be back on the air on some mm. Saturdays, most of the football season, which is great. Okay. Well, that's limiting too then, right? Sure. Because think about it. Because now we can't, in our title, have it called Saturday something because what if it's, it's on a, Sunday? It's, what it's if a it's on a Monday? Edition. I'd, you know what? It'd be kind of fun. Weekend's good. Weekend's good. But I think Sunday would be a party. That'd be great. Do Sundays? Like, That's my only day I don't have I, anything going on I, I professionally. Know. I say we do five minutes. Like five. Five, minutes. five minutes. Five minutes on Sunday. What'd you think? Yeah. <laughs> just, just yeah. Describe what you thought of the game using a picture and hold it up to the uh, the webcam. No, that can That's be quite fun. entertaining. Sounds like work. Might be. You know what else sounds like work? Uh spring football practice based on how Co- coach rule is yeah. running things it's um we all like his sound bites we like his take on things and i think it was the third cut we played this week from thursday where <laughs> we're not here to try hard we're here to win <laughs> <laughs> basically he's 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 over the aw shucks Good effort, fellas. And he wants to see some results immediately. And, and everywhere in the state, people are nodding their head. We've talked to a few linemen this week, and that's been a topic of conversation, the offensive line and confidence. And uh, he's trying to do a whole lot, guys, this spring with uh, the limited time he has. And um, it, it starts with, how you practice and how you, you prepare. And he's got a plan for that. And I don't know. I mean, we're, we're not at the level clearly of, of coaching or playing and seeing 
the results on Saturday. We we aren't we talk about it. We get to cover it. It's pretty awesome, but we're not involved in it like the kids that are invested, uh, the eighteen to twenty two year olds, and then even the coaches and coaching staff, past and present staffs. You just look at where this football team's at, and you just really wonder how far in his eyes they have to go to be good or competent next fall. That'll, that'll be a, a, a living thing and ongoing. Gosh, darn it, Bernie. <laughs> um, I told you to put it on your cardioid setting. No, I, I'm, cardioid, I'm Chris. She's got this giant football that squeaks. Um, so it, it's going to be a, 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 a process for Nebraska football to, to go get wins, and I just don't know how soon that'll happen. I think they'll be competitive. I think they'll look like a football team. When are the results going to flip, and and when are they going to be successful? Is it Minnesota? Is it uh, Colorado? Is it somewhere in October? I don't know. That's always kind of a fun Rubik's cube to to try and solve. And, and the, the the quote that kind of stands out to me in terms of how long this this rebuild and this build is going to take for Matt Rule, what they can be next year, is that quote that we keep on coming back to from the anonymous Big Ten coach last offseason, Nebraska being the all-bus team. They look like they should be great football players. That's why you hear Matt Rule talking at his spring press conferences saying, like, man, I don't know if I've ever had uh, a line this big or, or a team that's this big and athletic. And obviously – you want to be able to pump up your team a little bit whenever you're coming in and, and starting afresh, but I don't think that's necessarily false. There's a lot of, on paper, great athletes on this football team. It, it hasn't been, I would say for the most part, it hasn't been an athleticism issue at Nebraska in the past couple of years. It's been an issue of development, as we've talked about, and, and having real football players. And I, I think it just comes down to, to how much – you can develop guys in one offseason with the new strength and conditioning program, as we talked about a couple weeks ago on this show, that this team looks a little bit different. It's a question of turning them into football players, and I think we saw that, as I alluded to, I think it was yesterday on the show, with that Bo Pelini turnaround. Um, Callahan had some great athletes on this football team, and, and Bo Pelini was able to, in one offseason, add some pieces, turn some guys into, into football players and develop them in a way we hadn't seen yet under Callahan, and it turned into a, a good nine-win season his first year. So that's what I look back at. Uh, as like the example of how quickly things could get turned around. But I also understand Nebraska is a little further down than they were when the Callahan era ended. They need, and yeah, and it's sort of like when you say development, Nebraska's relied, I think, too much on the self-made types, right? And has, and has misfired and changed course too much on what they want to, their players to develop into. You, you know, the, the ones that maybe aren't as self-made. Uh, and guys I'm bringing up here, if you think about the, 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 na- the names that we've heard the most over the past few years, Adrian Martinez, pretty self-made, self-motivated guy, came in basically ready to play, <laughs> right? Like he did. We can talk all about what you know he did or did not accomplish, but in terms of physically being dialed in, being athletic, all that, ready to go. Garrett Nelson, another guy. Heard about him for years. He got on the field because he just works harder than most people. Like, he just does. Guys like Amir Abdullah, right, when you go even further back. But where you start to have a better program is when you can tap into those dudes that maybe aren't, right? Dudes that are that are physically have a lot of capacity to be good. But you got you to gotta be really smart about, okay, are we adding 20 pounds to this guy or dropping 20 and why? And what position are they going to play, right? And do, and tap into and develop those dudes. And uh, it seems like rule, the way that they run stuff, it seems like <coughs> everybody sort of has to be on that boat. And they really do have a plan for everybody. I think that's what we thought we were getting with Frost, mm. <laughs> right? Yeah, I remember that when he got hired, we were saying on the show, like, at least now we know there's going to be a plan for everything. Whether the plan works, who knows? But there will be a plan. Hindsight, eh, maybe there wasn't quite I think, a plan. I think, there was a, I think there was a plan. I just think there was some missteps in the execution 
of said plan. I think from a Fair. managerial standpoint, I think that's where the, the missteps Fair. probably had. Uh, I think the intentions were great. I think everybody who's come in here has had great intentions. <laughs> I mean, is, they, is, they've been, is that they've the been word? Su- is that the word execution of the plan? Is that yeah. maybe the is that maybe the edge that we're seeing with Rule so far? Is that he goes to pretty great lengths? By the way, we're saying all this; it doesn't mean they're going to win. Anything. It's his okay. it's his third time too doing right. this. I, I will say what we have seen physically: the guys seem like they're, they're it seems like bodies are transforming. In they're different. different. Ways. Mm. They're different. Right, they're tra- it's they're valuing movement, agility. It, it seems like mm-hmm. general athleticism more so than bulk and power. And there's a difference. And I think mm-hmm. Nash Hupmacher is a perfect example. I think uh, uh, Ben Hart is another guy that's kind of a perfect. I mean, they've really changed how they look physically, and and you've heard the. You've heard Rule and Staff emphasize that a lot. Is like, without saying it, they basically said, "Man, we got a pretty stiff team. Like these dudes are just kind of stiff, like, in, in general. Not everybody, not the you, self-made you're, you're, guys. You're not calling them stiffs, right? No, no, <laughs> not calling them stiffs. Saying that like physically, they're just like you know, they're not they, very they, limber. They don't not, move. They don't move. Right. And all you had to do was look at their flexibility, look at Nash. baby. And we all saw it with Nash last year. Like you know, the guy can bench press a bus. Like that—that that wasn't an issue. But at, the, at some point, it becomes diminishing returns. It's like, all right, man, you, you know, you don't need to just bench press a van. <laughs> you don't need you to, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. you don't. You're fine. You don't need to get stronger than you are now. You need to move a little more, right? And so it seems like they're emphasizing that. You would hope that translates to a better football team that gets more hats to the ball, makes more people miss. Covers better, all those things. Well, and go find what you want to be, and that is fast. That's an emphasis. You can get a fast defense, get a tough defense, and it can all work out for you. Uh, this will be interesting to see, too, Nebraska's shift in what they're emphasizing, and it's going to be tough offensive line play and, and then run game. I mean, it's going to be an offense that is going to be about running the football, running the foot. That's the the feel anyway, right? The, we'll see when, when things kick off in Minneapolis and beyond under the rule era. But that's the want is to be able to run the football, to, to be able to get third and three, and uh, to have a quarterback that's able to hurt you with his legs. Uh, so uh, that is something that has people excited, but it needs to – come to fruition how soon can you be a good running team and i'm glad he's talking up his offensive line i'm glad he's trying to get those guys confidence i'm glad he's outwardly selling to them i believe in you so you can believe in yourself uh but it's gonna be but it's gonna be about the work now we have two weeks till spring football ends with the spring game and then you have some some homework to do on that offensive line you got some homework to do with the staff who's our our five best and then you have training camp dude and is the say do ratio going to be close that was another problem with with uh a lot of stars yeah yeah you're right not just frost but a lot of them is like we want to run the football like okay great like but do you actually do that do you actually call the plays to do that? Do you practice in a way that does that? Do you call? Can you do it? Can you do Can it? Can you do it? Right. Like, really, how committed are you? It does seem like, if you're to believe what you're hearing right now, we talked about it a little last week with Gary too, as Brandon Vogel slides in, slides into our our four box here. If you're watching on YouTube Live, if you're listening on podcast, you should watch it on YouTube Live next Saturday, seven thirty ish. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, um, Vogue set the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so, uh, you know, there, there's that whole say-do ratio that was a little bit off, but you are hearing consistently, even down to receivers who are being recruited, those guys are even saying, 
yeah, th- you know, they're going to run the ball and then, you know, play action and, and hit me deep. That's what they're saying. They're really mm-hmm. committed to running the ball. So you're hearing it consistently f- all the way from the head coach talking directly to the media to a receiver recruit. And that tells me there's probably something to that, and they're actually going to try to do it. Vogues, uh, jump in here, bud. We're talking a lot of things that have been touched on this week by uh, pressers or uh, post-practice. And I, I like the the say-do ratio that cranac has been, been touching on. I want to see him follow through on the run game, but, but be able to do it. And um, this kind of got all kicked off by the we're not here to try hard. We're and thank the fans. We're here to win. Um, all the right things are being talked about here. But do you feel a, a pretty good sense of follow through with this staff? Um, and are they going to be able to do what they, they want to get done? Do, do you think they, they believe that they have the talent uh, here in the building versus saying they have the talent. Yeah, as it applies to the run game specifically, I think that's one where I'm, I'm looking at the, the say-do ratio could be one-to-one. Um, and, and I think the reason that I, I think that is because it seems like something specifically tailored to Nebraska for them. Um, like like Mark was just saying, uh, as I hopped on here, like everyone kind of says they want to run the ball. Um, it, it's one of those things where uh, you can, you can speaking of ratios, you can look at, uh, well, teams that rush the ball and have an advantage win X amount of times, but it's also one of those things like teams that are already run, winning tend to rush the ball because um, they're ahead. Right. It, it's different for me with this staff, I think, because you know, looking at least at Satterfield's two years at South Carolina, like <clears> – <throat> they weren't a predominant run team. Um, I mean, they had, they had Spencer Rattler this past year, but even when they had to basically have a graduate assistant step in and play quarterback in, in 2021, um, it wasn't like you didn't look at that offense and be like, boy, they're really committed to running football. So it does seem to me like it's something that when this staff got here um, in talking to former players, former coaches, uh, just pouring over, you know, 2022 game film and some knowledge of the Big Ten. Their assessment is: you need to, we need to be able to run the football. That's our best way forward. So, and you know, then you add up all of these other little things where things that Matt Rule was talking about in his intro press conference, we're starting to see now, just in in their approach. So, the say do ratio uh, has been in alignment so far for me. And I think we'll, we'll start to see that first and foremost with the run game. Yeah. And it's, I think anything short of a diabolical commitment to the run game is going to be, is is not going to be well received here. Now, one thing that's come up is, you know, the, the idea of a running quarterback and using him a little bit more, which Nebraska went away from last year. And then there's some talk about how that, how that sort of, sort of precludes Casey. Oh, that doesn't doesn't bode well for Casey. I don't buy that. The, the dude's built like a brick, and when he did run, he looked good running to me. He didn't look slow by any stretch. He has moves. Do, do you think he's somehow, you know, uh, not as much in the picture because he can't run, or do you view him as a bona fide runner if, if he's asked to do it? Yeah, um, I mean, I don't, I don't think, I don't think he's out of the picture by by any means. I mean, he brings so much to the table just in terms of experience. Um, his passing numbers, uh, which I know is not our, our focus at the moment, but uh, his his passing numbers ranked with a bunch of quarterbacks who, who won the majority of games in the Big Ten last year. Like they do not align with a team that went four and eight. Um, which you know is is a thorny problem to kind of get into once you once you start to look at it. But when you when you look at Nebraska's quarterback room, like I I, I don't know that I would put him mm-hmm. I'd put him behind Harburg for sure. I'd put him behind Sims. I'd put him behind Smothers in terms of rushing ability, like pure running ability. If if that's a facet of your offense that you really really prize. Uh, it's not that Casey Thompson can't do it. It's just that I think you've got some, some guys who are a little bit more skilled in that regard. And 
So the great unknown then is like, how much is this staff really going to value it? I go back to, to Satterfield's, you know, I think first press conference and he was asked about QB run and it, you know, his, his comments kind of struck me as a little bit, just kind of casual. He's like, Oh yeah, you kind of got to have it in today's college football, but it wasn't somebody who was pounding the table like he was for the huddle, for example. So um, <laughs> it's, you know, it, it makes for a run really the huddle. Yes. <laughs> we only run these plays so we can get back to the huddle. It's the most important part. It's the most important part of, of offensive football. Um, you know, I, I mean, Nebraska's QB situation right now is fascinating. There's, they don't lack for depth at the moment. We'll see. We'll see what, you know, the first two weeks of May might bring. Um, just because there's so much depth, you just kind of go in assuming that, well, there's going to be some change here somewhere. But who knows where? Because you've got to go like Casey Thompson, who, you know, if Sims doesn't arrive, I think we're all just assuming he's he's the the starter, and, and maybe even that would be faulty. Uh, with as much praise as we've seen for for Harburg, he sure seems to show up in those highlight videos quite a bit. Well, Brandon, whenever you look at the the praise for Harburg and and Casey really not being involved this spring, do you think that the question is how much Matt Rule and his staff want to? I guess, amend their offense for the type of player that they have? Because we've seen in the past, they like calling quarterback run from Satterfield at at South Carolina and Rural, both at Baylor and at Temple. Quarterback run is a big part of both of those offenses. So you look at that and you expect that's what they'd want to bring here. But you also hear that from a lot of coaches that we talk to, that the hallmark of a good coach is being able to build the correct type of offense or defense depending on the players that you have. So is that not the question going into the season? Not that these coaches want to call quarterback run, but how much they want to amend their offense for the best player that they have on the field? Yeah, you know, I get a sense uh, just in listening to the staff that they think they've got a chance to win some games this fall. You know, I'm not talking like, oh, this is a 10-2 and two team, I don't get that sense. But I also don't get the sense they're like, well, it's 4-8, and eight. It, it's going to be rough. Um, so I, I think with, with this staff, you'll that will lead the way in terms of the quarterback decision. So if, if you think, you know, well, maybe Casey Thompson isn't the runner we've had at some previous stops in the past, um, but he gives us our best chance to win, like I expect that to win out. I mean – the, the the main takeaway I've had from Rule's time on the job so far is kind of just extreme practicality, um, which might seem simple. It might seem uh, kind of like, well, yeah, I think that's what you get when you spend X million dollars for a head football coach, right? But I think we see it all over the country in various places. It's not always what you get, uh, extreme practicality. There's a lot of other concerns there. So I'm, I'm confident that Nebraska will, will do what it is that gives them the best chance to win the most games. I think in a vacuum, having a QB run element is what they think will do that. Brennan Vogel is with us from HailVarsity.com and Magazine at Brandon L. Vogel on Twitter is where you – Find him, get your subscription, get yourself an early Easter gift, and uh, can do so at com backslash offer. I want to go back to, to Casey for a moment in the running quarterback discussion. Listen, I I think Casey's a good enough athlete to be able to do it. I look at Casey Thompson's dad as one of the all-time, and I mean this lovingly, especially now, villains uh, for, for Nebraska football as an option wizard. I think Casey's a, a, a good enough athlete to be really dynamic at it. I think it's more the situation, Vogues and Cranach, where he goes to Texas and Sark is like, dude, we, we can't have you running. Stay in the pocket. Okay. Uh, and then he comes to Nebraska and it's Whipple. I think it's been more situation right? Uh, with, with Casey Thompson at Texas as a pro-style offense at Nebraska under whip and the pro style offense versus him just saying, no, nope, dude, I'm not a willing runner. Sorry. I think that's a false narrative. I think you got to give him a shot. Now he's got to be able to stay healthy. If he is going to put his shoulder down, they ran him selectively for sure. Uh, at least once or twice a game in the red zone, he had six touchdowns last year. He but, made guys miss. Yeah. He's, he's super, uh, Agile. I mean, he's super yeah. shifty uh, is the best way yeah. I'd put strong it. Strong, too. He's a and, strong and he's, runner. And he's just got to not get smoked uh, when he does 
when he does carry it. Now, most of his, I mean, his injuries have all come in the pocket, be it the thumb or the, or the, the arm. Yeah, this, this is why you don't run the pass. <laughs> I mean, you know, a lot of this, as it pertains specifically to Thompson, I think also comes down to how well can Nebraska run it with its with its handoff run game? Because if you can do that to the degree that they're they're hoping to, which wasn't the case during a lot of Adrian Martinez's tenure, as we remember, it was it was called it called the Adrian play when you needed to to pick up some tough yards. Quarterback for a lot counter. of a lot of that time. Um, I, I agree with you. I like. I think Casey Thompson has shown enough that you can show that and be like, okay, you can't just ignore the quarterback. Like this, he can be a, a run threat, but if you can run it consistently with your backs um, and behind a, an improved O line, then all you kind of need is the threat of QB run. You know, uh, let's have a let's do a fun little exercise here. All right, this is and and we know they're going to rotate guys in and out and. There's a lot to be determined, but let's say it's game one and you're going against Minnesota, but we have no idea what they're going to run, right? No clue. So it's sort of like base on base. Let's let's plot Nebraska's starting defense in the 3-3-5, all right? In the 3-3-5. So D-line, give me Nash and Ty Robinson and who? Who's the third? Judy. Judy? And do you guys agree it's Nash and Ty? Yes. Nash, Huttmacher, Ty Robbins. Okay, let's go to linebacker. Not Luke Reimer, Reimer, Nick Henrich, and... Well, th- this is interesting because I'm not even sure you Sherman? can... I'm not sure you can even pencil in Reimer and Henrich just yet because of the way that this coaching staff prioritizes speed. One of the things I saw earlier this week, it was... Uh, Kane Williams making a play. The, the former safety has moved up to linebacker, added some weight, and... I see that, and it really makes me think, okay, wow, that's a, a different body type that Nebraska's had there in a long time. And you look at the addition of a guy like uh, uh, Eric Fields out of Oklahoma in the, in the recruiting class this cycle, and you look at just the speed they're adding there. I'm not sure you can 100% pencil in Reimer and Henrich at that linebacker spot. Linebacker is one that's become more of a wild card than I expected. You just said it, though, Elijah. Hold on a second. You just said it, Elijah. We can 100% pencil them in because you can erase that. That's a great point. And this is April 8th. <laughs> That's a great this point. is April 8th, and we are figuring it out. We got our three defensive linemen. There are three linebackers with what we know now. Who are they? Who are they? Who are the three linebackers? I, I, I'm, I'm with Elijah on that. Like, I, I think I would still have Reimer, um, and then I'd be at Sherman, um, maybe Borders. And then you those, got Those are your three. And then you've got, you know, Jamari Butler in, in the mix, uh, I think. And, and like like Elijah said, there's some players in this recruiting class that I think are going to play right away um, at that linebacker spot. Now, this is where it gets really fun. DV. You got five of those dudes to figure out. Hartzog, Farmer. Newsom. Newsom. Those are shoe-ins. Who are the other two? Mm. It's hard out here. <laughs> uh, I might have that Omar Brown in the mix at the moment for, for one of those spots. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah, it gets tough. <laughs> tough in a good way for, for Nebraska. Yeah, Gifford's got to be in there. But they are going to shift guys around a lot, it, it sounds like. They said, no, we're going to play a lot of guys. And this, and this defense – I haven't looked at it a ton, Brandon. I don't know if you have like watched a ton of Syracuse yet. I've watched some. Um, and, and, you know, they say, again, like most defenses say, we're going to disguise things so they don't know. But I feel like they really emphasize that in the 3-3-5 where it's like kind of based on disguise. Is it? I mean, would you kind of see it that same way where it's it's based on creativity? Yeah, I think so. Um, and I mean, and this kind of goes back to the linebacker discussion, you know, every defense also says they want speed on the field. Of course they do. But I think this system um, really emphasizes that um, because, well, you've only got three, three down linemen. And a lot of times, uh, you know, when you're in a three down lineman 
uh, alignment, they're, they're going to be asked to like eat up blocks, do some two gap, not to take us back to the the Bo Pelini era. Um, so your blitzes and things, they're going to come from from a bunch of different places. Uh, you, you've got you've got your remaining eight guys back there, and, and any of them can come uh, based on on what you call. So it's got to be a kind of a malle- malleable group uh that that really has a high degree of speed i think that um nebraska has the potential to do to get there um particularly in the secondary but how it all fits together uh it's sort of by design not not made for us to to sit here and be like well it's it's he's here he's here he's here um Mm. i think there's gonna be a lot of shifting Brandon, one thing you, you mentioned uh, just a second ago is the fact that you think there's going to be some true freshmen, some guys in the newest recruiting class playing instantly at, at linebacker this season. And I want to move up a, a, a level in the defense and talk about the defensive line. You think that could be the case there as well? We heard Matt Rule earlier this week talk about the fact that Prince Will and Cameron Leonard have been guys that have been rotating in with some of the top groups this spring. And I want to know if you think that's by necessity or, or if that's because those guys have come in and shown out so much in their first spring. Yeah, I think a little bit of both, but um, cause, cause Nebraska, in my opinion, uh, could, could use a little additional depth on the, on the defensive line. That said, I think, I think the staff really likes Prince Will. And, and when you look at 24 sevens composite ratings, he was the top rated player in the class. Linhart, Linhart was number two. So if he, he's making a push, that's not a surprise. I mean, the fact that AJ Rollins, you know, two weeks ago was in a gray jersey as some somebody who's bouncing back and forth between sides of the ball and and now seems firmly on defense, I think tells you that they're looking for some depth there. Um, and and I think some of those those freshmen can can help provide that. I think you'll see players play right away there too. And you know, Maverick Newton, an, another player who's who's already on campus and, and getting those reps in. So this this. Their first recruiting class, if you just go by the recruiting rankings, it was probably strongest on the defensive line. And with a lack of uh, probably ideal depth up front, I think it would be more surprising if, if we didn't see some true freshmen uh, find a role in, in that defensive front. You bring up Prince Will. Do we have his last name nailed down yet? <laughs> I don't Mr. say it Prince often. Will. I don't say it often enough. Uh and I need to, but I think it's pretty much almost exactly like it looks. I think it's Uman Milan. Okay. So on film anyways, that's a really unique player. I, I can't remember a player like that. I, I mean, I, I just don't remember watching a player really on any team like him. He has very weird moves. <laughs> you know, You know what I'm saying? Like when you see him get to the quarterback, you're like, what? How did you just – what is that? Like, he's a real off-schedule kind of – I don't even know how you'd prepare for someone like him. It feels like he is total feast or famine. Yeah, he's, he's somebody who I look at and say, like, clearly the athleticism is there. It may not at this stage be the kind of football athleticism we're used to seeing. That said, I also kind of think back to, to Baylor and Temple – and you know it's not hard to to find some guys who who were kind of like that. Like I think, and I think as we go forward, we'll see that with this staff. Uh, well, we've already seen you know how much they they kind of prize like raw athleticism, athleticism you might see on track on the track before you see it on the football field. They're quite confident. Like we'll get your technique locked in, um, and as long as you're willing to put in the work. Uh, and, and you bring that athleticism, like we can do something pretty big here. That's what I think think of when I when I think of Princewell. Um, he's he's kind of a guy they've had success with in the past. Quick quick aside here on Princewell that I just think is kind of fun. One of my favorite things about him uh, is his family's names. His oldest brother is named Prince and is a defensive lineman at Tarleton State. Then his uh, his other older brother, the middle child, is Prince Lee a sophomore defensive lineman at Florida, and then he's the freshman at Nebraska, Prince Will. I love a, a good theme in the names in the family. That's good. It's pretty good. Vogues, uh, we were talking to Dr. Rob Zadiska yesterday and love getting his perspective. Really excited that the uh, Hale Varsity Club is going to have that O-line, that pipeline event coming up here the Friday before uh, the spring game. Uh, and 
having all five members of the pipeline there and some guys are still in the state some guys are are not and for everyone to come together is really impressive but what dr rob was talking about was seeing guys actually live up to potential and and he focused on some nebraska linemen that were decent they did a okay work uh, in lincoln but now they're they're in the nfl and uh, they they are better NFL players than they were college <laughs> players, and that yeah. just that that wears out a number of former guys because they're sad for the kids they didn't get the development that they got uh, during the, the the Osborne years. And you know, I think of some guys. I think of a like a Nick Gates, right? Gates okay. is kicking ass. Got a monster contract, even after a brutal injury <laughs> and, and Gates was really good against Michigan state on that night in 2015 as a red shirt freshman. And then, you know, Gates was kind of just there and, and then he was an undrafted guy. And then now he's on his second team, but he's <laughs> gone from undrafted uh, practice squad guy to starting center. <laughs> so touch on, on your Captain too. Yeah, big time captain. Touch on your thought here on hitting that potential in the name of development because that's how it you, – you always saw it happen. And it didn't happen for every kid, but it was probably a, a pretty sweet 8 out of 10. It felt like, at least when we were growing up watching Nebraska football. Yeah, I mean, you know – <laughs> to take it back to, to ratios, it, it made it made sense at Nebraska on the offensive line for a long time. Um, you know, Dominic Raiola, great offensive lineman, goes to the NFL, great great lineman there. And, and somewhere along the line, that got skewed. Like I, you know, I, I, I won't be able to remember Nebraska's O line draft history off the top of my head. But you know, somebody like Gates, um, were you guys blown away by Alex Lewis's once one season at Nebraska? No, but he went and played in the NFL and had, Fifth round. had a decent, you know, um, that, you know, that is kind of the lasting memory we have of late of, of Nebraska. It's like these offensive linemen are, are good enough to, to get selected and they go off and, and kind of play their best football in the NFL. And, you know, if you're a Nebraska, if you're a former player, former offensive lineman, no less, certainly. But if you're a Nebraska fan sitting there and being like, well, what's, what's the deal here? Um, why did we only get, you know, kind of 80 cents on the dollar? Um, and it's not, it's not the players. I, I don't, I don't think. Um, certainly it was just something has been off there. So this this upcoming season, I think, will be a good test for it because, you know, I, I believe the staff likes what they have up front. Um, I, I think they've, they, they believe they've got some, some top-line offensive players, some future NFL uh, offensive linemen. But it's kind of been this underlying tension, and it will probably be there all offseason because everyone who watched Nebraska's O-line last year and in recent years is kind of like, oh, that, that wasn't great. Like, you can go – Go look at the sack numbers, sacks allowed. Look at the, the struggle to run the ball consistently. The pressure yeah. rate makes you reach for a drink. Yeah, but throughout, Rule and, and his assistants have been like, no, like we think the offensive line could be good. So it's just it's just going to be there because, we, you know, the spring game's not going to prove, I don't think, oh, they're right. Like the offensive line looks a lot better. And if it does, if that is one of the takeaways from the spring game, might want to just like dial that back a little bit. Cause I don't know if that's the, uh, if that's the forum for, for making those, those kind of decisions. He, he called Ben Hart an NFL player this week. A guy who like was one of the lowest rated offensive linemen in the big 10 for half the year. Yep. <laughs> that's that, that's, that's a confidence thing. I mean, he's got to yeah. speak it into existence. So Ben Hart believes it, it can be real. Uh, he's got the measurables, but it's a mentality. And I think he's a guy that, bless his heart, still at it. I mean, because he's taken a lot of arrows, man. Ben Hart has. Yeah. Oh, and he yeah. keeps on trucking. Bogues, are you going to be able to sneak out and see Air, the movie? You're a big Jordan guy. I've already seen it. Um, I, oh, I, wow. went saw, I went and saw it the, the night that it opened. Um just because that was like one of the, <laughs> the 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 actual holes in my calendar. It wasn't like I was like I have to see this the day it comes out. Like it's you know, 
Star Wars in 1977 or something. Um, <laughs> it's it's good. Um, it's kind of an at, at the end of it, it's kind of an odd uh, ode to Nike's corporate maneuverings, which I think we knew going in. I mean, that's what the movie is about. It's about landing Michael Jordan. Uh, that said, it's it's really well handled. Um, so overall, I, I, I liked it quite a bit. And, you know, hmm. one of the things I think, one of the great things about having Matt Damon and Ben Affleck involved in this is like, we know that they're, they're pretty serious sports guys. Hmm. So there's not a lot that they get wrong with, with the sports piece of it, which is always the danger. I think when oh, going yeah. into any sports movie. Oh, Will there yeah. someday be a, a Nebraska documentary about landing Dylan Riola? <laughs> um how it didn't go well i was gonna say ask, <laughs> how ask it worked me, ask, ask me again in in two mm-hmm. months um there might be enough enough inherent drama and tension there for that um i guess the question will be will nebraska fans <laughs> want to be the want to be the audience for that will that be a movie they want to see mm-hmm. on opening night it's prediction 30, sure to go wrong nebraska 30, 30. does not get Nebraska does not get Dylan the first go round, but they get him as a transfer in two years. That's my prediction. Yeah. That's a prediction. that's kind of becoming the 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 bet the better bet with 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 some of these quarterbacks. And be like, ah, oh, we'll we'll check in again in two years. Yeah. Uh, I was just writing uh, a kind of a QB roundup in the Big Ten because it is so hard to to keep up with for for the April issue and Illinois. Had, well, Illinois got an Ole Miss transfer who's probably going to be the starter. But if he's not, they also got Ball State's starter who, <laughs> right? But his <laughs> great-grandfather, grandfather, and uncle all lettered at Illinois. Someone in his family lettered at Illinois in 1935. And uh, kind of like, well, if, if Luke Altmeyer, who didn't really play a ton at Ole Miss, doesn't work out, Check out this guy. Check out this story. His, his family's been playing Illini football for nearly a hundred years. Somebody <laughs> in his family's purposefully gone to Champaign and lived there for four years yeah. in different parts uh, in uh, different decades. That reminds me, by the way, in the Hale Varsity f- uh, Photography Archives of the little kid that, and he's probably not a little kid anymore, with the Nebra Noy shirt. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> <laughs> it's a kid <laughs> somehow. When Nebraska was at Illinois, you know those half shirts where yeah. it's it says never on one side and then oi on the other, like never noi. It's, it's the worst like conjunct yeah, combination of, of names ever. Bogues, what's happening this weekend? What are you doing? Uh, working on that April issue for the most part, I and mean, it's kind of full steam ahead on on yearbook prep. Um, those I'm kind of deep in my my notebooks with uh, getting those opponent previews ready, but I, I like that process. It always kind of leaves me, I think, with a, a better understanding of where these teams are at. Um, and it, you know, it gets tougher each year because the line, the, the rosters are always always shifting. So um, that's kind of on the docket for me. We'll obviously have baseball coverage at the end of the weekend and a couple of football stories. Uh, to come tomorrow still, Jacob Jacob Padilla just uh, published, I think, his last position breakdown for Nebraska basketball on HaleVarsity.com right now, and those are always a good a good long read. Um, so we'll have plenty of stuff throughout the weekend. For that preview, yeah. by the way, can you bring in for the Nebraska – for the Illinois opponent preview, can we bring back Nebernoy, that photo? Can that just, I'll, I'll, see, if, I'll see if we can feels slide, like it that, would work. slide that in. Yeah. <laughs> it feels like it would work. Vogues, uh, take care, buddy. Thanks for the time today. All right, guys. Thanks. All right. Good uh, to get caught up with uh, one Brandon Vogel. We welcome in the uh, Iron Horse. Gary Big Sharp Nebernoy is with guy. us. Hey, good, dude, good morning. I love, the, I love the hat, man. Good work. Good work. Thank you. Have you Thank been you. I got someone eat. take care of you? No, I have never been. Somebody went down there. They felt bad for me, and they brought me back a hat. I love it. No, I mean, those yeah. uh, buddy of ours in studio, uh, Bill Hooks has been three times and Hooksy um, had his master's hat on. But no, anytime you see someone rocking the the master's polo or kind of the zip up or the hat, yeah. dude, it, that is a flex. I think it's it really is a, awesome. It is a flex. 
like every year I apply for tickets, like I think most of us do. And then we wait for that email that says, sorry, but we love your support of the Masters. Here's the middle I'm, finger. Yeah, but I'm probably <laughs> glad that I'm not there this year. Like no. what if this year you would have gotten tickets on Saturday and Sunday? You would have been like, uh, is this the real experience of Augusta National? But Welcome to Augusta National Golf Club, gentlemen. Well, in addition to the weekend weather, Gary, if you bought tickets this year, you ran the risk of having a tree fall on you. So, yeah, that way, hey, that's uh, that was scary. But man, how did nobody not get hurt? I mean, those were giant trees that fell down. They were all in yeah. line for four dollar beers, which is also sweet <laughs> at uh, at Augusta. Gary, a lot of Ironic was there too. Uh, one, one more time, Paige Speronic was there too. Okay. So, you, uh, you, uh, I don't think Schmidt uh, knows who that is, and that's... Mark, are you a, a big <laughs> follower of Paige? She sometimes pops up on my feed. Yeah, that, I'm not mad about it. That's what we all say. Sometimes she pops up. Gosh, I wish I would have used that excuse back when I was 18. The algorithm must be wrong. Man, I don't know why she's popping up. <laughs> that's pretty good. I clicked on her once, and then now it's just everywhere. You know, once. What do you do? Mm-hmm. Uh, Sharpie will, uh, will transition here, cowboy. Um, I can't undo it. Uh-huh. Too late. I wanted to, to get your thought here on we, – we were talking a lot about – Nebraska and the offensive line and um, just what what you believe with the, the the talking points by rule on the offensive line. Do you like that he's talking up the O-line? Do you like the fact that there's this narrative, this purposeful narrative on what he thinks of his guys in that room? You got to obviously say that, yeah. but it, it's – it's more um, more of a stout defending of the offensive line with uh, what he thinks. I mean, he's he's kind of building them up through um, through what he's seeing, he sees, and what his experience has been. So he's he's setting the table up for them to to live up to some hype, and it's, that's well, one thing we've we've not heard a lot about. The one thing that we've not heard about the offensive line the last few years is hype, uh, at least when it comes to Saturday performances. Um, and I think you guys, you guys have listened to him enough and you guys have talked about it enough. He never, Matt Rule never says anything that is not intentional. And I don't think he's, he's not a guy that strikes me as he's just going to blow smoke. So there's going to be some people that take anything he has as a player evaluation in spring with a grain of salt. And that's perfectly fine. But I will tell you this, talking to a former Nebraska offensive lineman that was at practice on Thursday, the day that Matt Rule made the comment about Bryce Benhart as an NFL player. And I asked him and he said, yes. He looks different. And I think as we're going to find out, and and probably this is why it's going to be hard to handicap this team until they start playing football games where they turn on the scoreboard, is there are guys that have more confidence right now because their bodies are different. And he's going to be one of those guys. He couldn't, and we, we ran this through the gamut last fall, he couldn't bend. He just could not bend. And we were all like, how do you take a prospect out of Minnesota that is highly rated, and all of a sudden he gets here, and he can't play football. He cannot play consistent football. What happened? Well, we talked about, man, as an offensive lineman, he can't bend. That is like A number one. You look at him now, and this person told me, yes, uh, uh, you know, he actually told me yesterday after going on Thursday, he said he's got bend to him. He plays with a lot more confidence. The linemen look a little bit leaner. Um, so you have confidence that your body feels good, and then you have a belief which is the two staples of Matt Rule that I believe, confidence and belief, you have belief that you can go out and do something because the coaches have trust in you and it's vice versa. It's, it's quite the experiment. It almost seems too simple, but we've complicated football around here for so long. Gary, whenever you, you talk about that lack of bend, that's something we hit on a little earlier in the show. What do you think that comes down to? Is that an error in strength and conditioning? Is that coaching? Is that an error just in the development plan in general? Where do you think that that, that downfall began? And and do you think with Coach Riola, it's a, a one-year type fix that you can get that fixed in one offseason? Well, I think it's, it is a little bit of strength and conditioning because they did a general idea what they wanted their offensive linemen to do. I'm noticing with this new staff, whether it be nutrition or strength and conditioning, they're individualizing stuff. Not – not every lineman should lift the same way or their body should be the same way. Um, and you saw last year, guys were, guys were stiff. They were blocks of concrete. They had 
They had shoes that, man, were in concrete. Now I think they've individualized guys and they've taken a look at every single guy. And what do we need to do with their body to get them where they have flexibility, they can have power, they can have their strength back, and they can most importantly have their confidence. So I think it's a little bit of that. And then I think it also starts at the top. Like all of us have bosses that we don't like, but if they have belief in you and they install some confidence because they have confidence in you, man, you might go above and beyond. I mean, you might be over your skis in your performance, and I think we might see that with some guys on this roster that they're going to put in key situations. Yeah, and we were talking earlier, Gary, about the say-do ratio also of what the coach yeah. says versus what they emphasize. Will this work? We don't know. That's not what we're saying here. But it does seem pretty clear that what they talk about, what they say, is consistent across the board. Yeah. Yep. Every assistant's parroting it. Recruits are parroting it. Players are parroting it. So everybody's kind of on the same page there. And then it feels like they're calling plays and doing drills and and all yeah. that to, to back it up. Yeah, no, I agree with you. Because if you, if you say, hey, we're going to win. Yeah, we all want to win. But what are you doing to ensure that you win? And if you have a pile of evidence of this is what we're working on, attention to details, the small things, guys getting better every single day, that that's going to lead us to a win. I believe it when you say we're going to win. So it's a staff that really isn't blowing a lot of smoke. And when Matt Rule says stuff, he says it with a purpose. He's not just saying it to move on to the next question when he has these media settings. Uh, you know, and, and I look at this, and I know a lot of people, and this is really – this is a credit to Matt Rule because how many times have you heard people, and I think we talked about this a couple weeks ago, say, oh, I'm not drinking the Kool-Aid. He's done a very good job of bringing the temperature down in the room and kind of forming the narrative of, Hey, don't make a judgment on us. I'm going to show you and I'm going to tell you and our players are going to tell you and our assistants are going to talk to you about what we're doing. So this is our plan and this is what we're going to do. I know you've been burned in the past, but just trust us. This has worked before and it's going to work here. And so you don't hear people going, oh, I'm not I'm not drinking the Kool-Aid or, oh, come on, coach. You have people now that are like, you know what? It's things they're doing now could get them two or three more wins in the fall. Gary Sharp's with us here, Hail Varsity Weekend. And Sharpie, a thought we will stick with the O-line for just a touch longer. And you've had Nuri talked about. You've had Ben Hart highlighted. Uh, you've got Scott that's been uh, – he's coming back in a, in a week or, or back at it anyway. And then, you know, Teddy's out there. Thought on Turner Corcoran. Where's his role? Where's – yeah. Turner um, slated or slotted. Do you think he could well, be that swing tackle? No, I, I think he would, move in, he would move inside. But he's the one guy that really has not been talked about this spring. And I, I think there's probably a reason for that. Um, you know, he's kind of in no man's land because Ben Hart's going to be the tackle opposite Teddy. Mm -hmm. And then, as you mentioned, you go Noelle. There is that other guard spot open in Scott. I mean, let's say Turner Corcoran moves into guard. How would you guys feel about that five when they open up on a Thursday night in Minnesota? But one final thought on Corcoran. I think pay close attention. There hasn't been a lot of chatter about him this spring, and I think there's a reason for it. He is He's not at the level that the Ben Hart's and the Scott's and even the Noelle's is. Teddy isn't healthy, and he's getting back to being 100%, so we mm -hmm. kind of leave him on the side. And we still don't know a lot about Teddy because he hasn't played a lot of football. Mm -hmm. But Corcoran is a mystery to me on what's going to happen to him. But I, I think he's – if he wants to play, he's got to move inside. But asking you three, if you opened up against Minnesota with that five, an offensive line that's got a lot of football under their tires, are you feeling good about that offensive line? I I am, but the reason I'd feel good, and, and I think it's going to be a nice option, and you'll have the ability, because Piper's changed. Piper's played a lot of football, too, so that left guard spot was, you would think, is between Piper and, and, and Corcoran. But no, I'd feel good because of the confidence part. I mean, there's still the the reality of having to go do it. Absolutely. But I think they are going to get coached up enough where they'll uh, they have the old Ted Lasso sign above the, the, the door <laughs> that says believe. I think I think they'll be able to get these guys right between the ears. And well, they're clearly getting them right physically with what they're drilling. So they'll see that that work pay off eventually. And 
I don't know that they beat Minnesota, but I think they can feel good about the unit. They've all been here, and most of them have been highly rated uh, kids coming in. Uh, So I think they I think they really trust uh, Coach Donnie. And I don't know that it means it's a win, bud, but I think if you give me those five, I think they can feel really good about wanting to lean it on. They wear the run the damn ball hat for the last three years. They've got a staff and a, and a head coach that wants to, to live up to the old uh, yeah. brand uh, of running yeah. the ball. But but on the flip side, and, and to answer Gary's question directly, those five I feel fine about, Like which made, I, I think that's a, a five that can get you to a bowl game. Where I worry is the depth. I think you have a starting five, but what happens if, if one of those guys goes down? What happens if Prohaska goes down and now you have to maybe slide Turner back out to tackle? Is it Gunnar Gatula that's going to step up and, and be that guy? That's where I get worried whenever you look at the grind of a, a Big Ten slate. What does that, that second unit look like? Not necessarily that first five. Yeah, and, and yeah. They, do, they do like Latovsky. That's another one that they've uh, – you know, we've, I think we as a collective here have liked Lutovsky. Um, this staff, I think, has sees something in him that maybe got lost last year in the transition from one staff to another. Mm. And then I think Piper is another guy that came on yeah. late last year, has also transformed his body like we've been talking yeah. about, and is kind of on schedule in, in a classic offensive line sense where you know it takes those guys a few years to be ready um, to where, yeah, I think he's – I think he's firmly in the mix also at guard. And as part of this, everything we're talking about here, <clears throat> did Corker, I think Corcoran and, and Ben Hart, <clears throat> excuse me, I think Corcoran and Ben Hart were, I think they, they were forced into action too early. I, I, I just Big don't time. think those are guys yeah. that you would normally yeah. have seen if you had legitimate depth at the offensive line position, if you got transfers to come in and fill some spots. And so I, it's almost unfair, I think, to judge what they're capable of because they went through multiple offensive coordinators, multiple offenses, multiple offensive line coaches, and God, they were only here for like a couple of years and just thrust into action. Yeah. And and by the way, doing it at places like left tackle against top five yeah. draft picks. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you know there's a you know? there's a there's a sneaky thing, I and mean, and it just popped in my head when left tackle. Um, what did you guys think when Rule, who, you know, it's also we also have to acknowledge that him working with the offensive line and him being more in tune with Donnie is going to be a big benefit to that whole room. But how about the idea? First of all, we go five years where we don't want to tackle. We don't want to go live in in practice good on good to Thursday. They stretch and five minutes later, they've got their quarterbacks live Mm -hmm. going inside of the five yard line on, on one V one. And you're thinking, Whoa, what's going on here? But it's all about a mindset. But how about the fact that, if we say Ben Hart's going to be an NFL guy, and and I was told that he looks different and he kind of looks the part, and he's he is better than he has been, is okay. If he's going to be an NFL guy, and I'm an NFL guy that just said that, then we're going to test him on a daily basis because he's going to get tested when you play Michigan, when you play Ohio State, when you play Iowa, when you play Minnesota mm-hmm. teams that have a really good pass rusher. Let's find the guy that we think is one of the up and coming pass rushers on this team. And he's going to go against Ben Hart and vice versa every day when he said, we've got Butler going against Ben Hart and vice versa because it's going to make them better. When was the last time we heard something like that broken down to we're not only good on good, we're going to go the good against the good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, That's they, encouraging. You got to feel great about that if you're a Nebraska fan because you're, it's all about the preparation, Sharpie. Yeah. 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 Well, they, they're, they're, it's just it, – it's fascinating because – I've talked about this for a long time is there are things you can do in winter and spring ball that probably you set the pace and you set the foundation that there's one or two games when you get to the fall that when it's over and you win, you go, you know what? Yeah. Because of what we did in the winter, what we did in the spring that helped us a lot in a situation like that. I, I see this staff doing that. They are paying more attention to the importance of spring football than we've probably seen in a while because they know what they're doing right now. That's going to be a fallback when they get squeezed in the fall of, Hey, we stuck together. This is, you learn this in the spring, you learned adversity. You learned about the idea of 75 yards rushing in the fourth quarter. We can do it. That's another part of the belief and confidence. I believe is they're telling the offensive line, Hey, our basic success relies on you five guys or five plus whatever Jeff Sims success depends on you. 
we're putting it on you and we're going to let you guys go and eat. We've said that out loud, but how many times have we backed it up in a while mm-hmm. around here when it comes to the offensive line, which there's no there's no getting around. The offensive line hasn't produced all Big Ten guys or first or second day NFL guys in a long time. And that can't happen at Nebraska for them to be successful. You know, we've spent a lot of time on offensive line today and kind of every other position, I think, over the past few weeks, except for wide receiver. Just haven't had a lot of talk about who Nebraska is going to split out. Um, I think we can assume that that Marcus Washington and Billy Kemp will have some spots locked down. But the curveball and a guy that you're familiar with for sure, Gary, and I think that we were all very high on before he left, Xavier Betts. He has made a return to the team. Early word, what have you heard or not heard about how that's going? The guy was out of football for an entire year. He looks the part. You're right. You haven't heard a lot about wide receivers. And they're there. You've heard more about the tight ends. Um, I think there's a lot of questions at wide receiver. I I just Mm do. There's Billy Kemp and Marcus Washington are two givens. But after that, it's kind of up in the air. And I'm curious, the portal opens up a week from today if Nebraska goes and finds another wide receiver. You know, they've got, you know, Malachi Coleman is coming. He'll probably be pressed into action in his first year. But, yeah, I, you're, you're right, Mark. I wish I would hear more about the wide receivers. And it's not just Garrett McGuire speaking. It's not really anybody else is talking about the wide receivers because it's primarily been focused on the quarterbacks, the offensive line, and the running backs to a, uh, an extent, but also about the tight ends. But they're going to need those wide receivers. And, and, and also, you know, the wild card is, is Elante Brown going to be, you know, getting things taken care of back home that he'll come back uh, for the fall as well? And that that would help immensely. Is part of that, too, just what they're emphasizing right now, maybe, though, where it's like, no, no, we're, when we say we're going to run the ball, we're really going to run the ball. And so they're focusing on kind of the 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 middle of the offense <laughs> yeah, versus yeah. the outside. And, and it's the receiver's role really going to be play action deep shots for the most part. Yeah, a little bit. But I also – I think it's probably, I mean, we weren't super enamored with the wide receivers when spring began. So probably a lot of the questions that we've had about wide receivers, we probably still have two weeks out from the spring game. Sharp, you want to switch gears to basketball, Nebraska in the portal, <laughs> and a name that's uh, well known and we loved covering him is Hunter Salas. I know uh, Fred and Lindsay are going to make the roadie to Spokane Sunday. It's an Easter Sunday visit for one Hunter Salas. What are you feeling right now for Nebraska's chances? Also, you hearing anything on, on Chucky Hepburn? Does he want to come home? All right, so let's go with Hunter. So it's, it's huge that Nebraska's flying to Spokane. Uh, Wake Forest is going to be there as well. But as you mentioned on Easter, um, he's a priority for them. You know, they've also pitched Latrell Wrightsell Jr., who was a guard at Omaha Central, um, that those two could play together. Uh, you know, neither one of them play the position that Nebraska desperately needs, and they'll they're, they'll go everywhere to find a point guard. I mean, they'll go all over the world to find a point guard. That's what they need. You know, they didn't get Creasa going to West Virginia. Um, I, I Their chances are getting better with Hunter. Uh, I don't know what Hunter wants. You know, I, I, he wants to start. Uh, is he? Does he want the ball in his hands more? You know, he's he's probably a two or a three. Now, he's a great defender, but is he going to be able to score in the Big Ten – because Nebraska needs scores. Now, I like Bryce Williams, the athletic wing they have on campus this weekend. Now to the other part about Chucky. Ironically, Chucky is here in Omaha this week, um, Easter week, so he has left. I get the sense, and this is as of right now, and this is just, this is my gut, that Chucky is going to stay at Wisconsin. But I'm going to throw you uh, something to think about. And and I say he's going to stay at Wisconsin because he has had, Wall is coming back, they resolved the situation. Greg Gard is coming back. They've sat down with Chucky and they said, we want to have the offense next year a little bit more free flowing. So you can just go out and hoop. So you can score and you can pass the basketball and it'll be a little bit more free flowing where you're the head of the offense. So they've had that discussion is. And I, so I so I, I think and people I talk to that, you know, know Chucky pretty well or even have played pickup ball in the last week with him. Um, they, they get the sense that Chucky's going to go back to Wisconsin. But, guys, there's a team in Nebraska that just lost a star point guard that <laughs> has a Elite Eight roster. 
Should we mention Creighton about Chucky if we're oh, talk yeah. about Chucky Hepburn? I that I just I, I keep thinking about that. Nemhard leaves. They need a point guard. There's a point guard from Nebraska who, you know, is really good. It's just, it started <laughs> for two years in the Big Ten. I mean, in this wild, wild west of the portal world, nothing is out of the realm of possibility. But it's just my feeling right now that Chucky will be back at Wisconsin. He would he would change their dynamic defensively too, yeah. big time. Yeah. If he yeah, did I, that, he's a he's a great defensive yeah. point guard. Yeah, I, I I think you know there were, we, we've have we have a lot of Nebraska kids that went into the portal have already found a destination, and a lot of people were speculating on Chucky. I I, I think I just I, again the people I talk to that know him a lot better than I do, they get the feeling that it's going to be okay in Madison, and that's where he wants to play. Yeah. Sharpie, last thought, bud, and we'll get you out. Thanks for jumping on this morning. Big time win for Nebraska baseball, three to one, extra innings. Uh, pitching was fantastic, just two hits allowed. Uh, Bryce, uh, enough offense. And uh, the uh, the mood is what for you with Husker baseball? Do you think they're they're, in a good way, getting downhill now? Do you think they've kind of found some rhythm? So we got to take out the midweek stuff because they're still searching for a starter. But I have said now for a couple of weeks, they're a contender to win the regular season of the Big Ten because they have two really good uh, starters in Olsen. And then you get Kaminsky tomorrow. Now he's got to pitch better than he did last week uh, down in Texas. But then Kaminsky to today. Get, yeah. Kaminsky today. Yes. Um, yeah. But last week, he, he that was the first like blip on the radar where he didn't pitch so well. But you get you get, you know, a great Friday guy. You get a great Saturday guy. If you figure out Sunday and you start winning series, you win two out of three, and then you sweep a couple here, you're in a really, really good spot. Nebraska's a ways away from an at-large, but maybe if they're able to make a run and win the regular season because they still have the Marylands and the Iowas on the schedule, that can help them. You know, they still have that Vanderbilt win that that looks good, but, man, when you drop midweek games, it gets further and further away. But I like where they're at. You know, they're just they're win, they're finding a way to win games. And that bullpen has settled down. I mean, that bullpen is really looking good right now. And if you can combine that and get enough offense and Matthews and Anderson are going, then I like their chances. But they're playing well right now. Today's a key day because you don't want to go from the excitement of winning in 10 yesterday with Bryce's two run homer to having a clunker today, especially with Kaminska on the mound. But I like where they're at. I mean, buy your tickets to the Big Ten baseball tournament. They're going to be in Omaha this year. There is no doubt. And it looks like Will Walsh is going to be that third guy for Sunday that, that they're trying. Um, and so I think he's going tomorrow, isn't he? Yes. Yeah. <clears throat> yep. Yeah, did, so, did you just give me the Matumbo finger? You just went, I, <laughs> he's telling me to no, shut no, no, up, no. not no, you. No, it's, no, it, no, that's the no. direction to me. Well, Gary, what, one last thought one here more. before we get you out, before we all shut up and, and let everyone get on with their Saturdays. Uh, <laughs> are you an advanced analytics guy when you look at that Husker lineup, when you look at Bryce and, and Max? Because – the advanced analytics, their OPS both over 1,200, which would let, lead you to believe that's a, a pretty elite hitting season. What have you just made of been for the Husker baseball team and the Husker hey, offense this year? I, I've said this. I, I, Max Anderson and Mike Bovey, who plays third base at Omaha, are the two best players in the state of Nebraska, and they're both Nebraska kids. It's kind of like Max has re- been really, really good. If you watch him at Millard West, you were bummed that he committed to Texas A&M because you'd like to see him stay home. He is – He's kind of taken it upon his role, and man, he looks so comfortable playing second base, hitting the ball, and you know. Then Bryce Matthews, Bryce Matthews from two years ago is back at the plate. I mean, they are they are setting the tone, and they're getting on base, they're driving in runs, they're creating havoc, they're driving up pitch counts. Those two are such a huge asset to this offense. I really like where Will's got this team. You get, you know, they got to take out the midweek stuff, but on the weekends. They're playing like a really good baseball team, and it's only the you know the first weekend in April. Yeah, and you're talking about you got two guys over 400 through 27 oh, it's, games. Well, it's I mean, look it's, at you, when when we're on April 8th, and you're still mentioning, hey, Ken Harvey's batting averages could still be in play. That says something because we know when when Ken hit well over 400, we we're like, whoa, you did that in college baseball. Well, you got two guys <laughs> that are doing it now, and and I and you know something else. I, 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 maybe it's dawned on me more this year at Haymarket Park. Haymarket Park has turned into a, 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 a launching pad. I mean, <laughs> it has become yeah. all offense in that ballpark. Well, yeah. uh, it's been windy. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're really talented, too, though, on offense. Gary Sharps with us. Sharpie, enjoy your holiday weekend, man. We'll get caught up again, and thanks for your time. Happy Easter, uh, or however you celebrate. 
Um, I hope everybody had a good Friday, and I'm disappointed that we we had the master's hat, but we did not have a rabbit anywhere. You couldn't have put in like rabbit ears on your dog, Schmitty. Well, I think you're going to that furry convention next week, in Reno, <laughs> aren't you? Dude, I have seven thousand hey. rabbits behind me, to my left, to my right. I have so much garbage with freaking ears. I, I'm not kidding. I could take you on the tour. She has 400 rabbits here. There's 30 staring at me right now. Maybe it's because you call her Bunny. Well, I mean, she is. Thought about yes. that. No, I know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, She's embraced. She had a freaking T-shirt on Thursday. Yeah. It's a giant rabbit. Something, <laughs> and you did a hand motion about. Your no, rabbit. I know. So, yeah. Okay. Well, on that point, before we get taken <laughs> off the air. Uh, thank it's you for having good. me on, as always, um, and have a, a wonderful Easter to everybody and all of your uh, great listeners who uh, I love talking to every Saturday. Appreciate you, man. Take care. Follow Paige Speronic for all your Masters news. Oh. That's, uh, <laughs> I think the, I think in conclusion, so the only conclusion we can come to.